today on Call Out, Nelson Sar scrambles to rescue a hiker who's fallen into the deadly Class 5 rapids of Kokanee Creek. I haven't heard that he's come out, so uh, I'm not holding on too much hope for the guy. And later, Nelson Sar member Chris Armstrong travels to Winnipeg, Manitoba to take part in the annual Sar Scene Games and Conference. Members from all across Canada get together and compete in all different ground search and rescue skills. Sunday, 4.03 p.m. Nelson Search and Rescue is called out to Kokanee Creek Provincial Park, 20 minutes north of Nelson, British Columbia. Local resident Scott Newland has fallen into Kokanee Creek, a glacier-fed river with near freezing temperatures and deadly Class 5 rapids. The outlook is grim. Nelson team leader Chris Armstrong and another SAR member are en route. The rest of their team, about an hour behind. I haven't heard that he's come out, so uh, we're expediting here, but I'm, I'm not holding on too much hope for the guy. When I heard that someone had fallen into Kokanee Glacier Creek, knowing the area, knowing it's choked full of wood, rocks, it's falling down a very steep, steep valley. It's incredible water and it's not survivable. I had mentally prepared myself for the worst. I knew that most likely we were going to be doing a, a complicated recovery in some very steep water. Mark the trail here, so let's go. On their way down to the creek, they received some encouraging news. So I've heard from a constable on scene, and they've actually found him. He's on a log. I knew we had to get down there as fast as we could, because if he had survived, he wasn't going to survive long without help. Chris arrives to find a large group of bystanders, two ambulance paramedics, and an RCMP constable already on scene, holding a rope attached to the subject. One of the bystanders had actually crawled out onto the log, put a blanket on him, and had wrapped a, a tow cable around his waist and ran it to shore to keep him from falling in. I needed to remove that. It's a hazard. We have a, a rule within Swift Water that you never attach a rope to yourself unless it has personal release capability. So that if something goes wrong, we can release it with two fingers at any time with no problem. If he had fallen in the river and the current had grabbed him, you know, that would cinch right up and put him in a terrible body position, which might not be head to the surface. At the same time, however, if Scott had fallen into the river with no line at all, the current would have catapulted him right into a log jam 10 meters downstream. And that would have been it. It's a tough call. Exhausted, battered, and bruised, Scott has simply been hanging on for dear life just a few meters from shore, waiting for search and rescue. It didn't look like it was very far, but it's super cold water. All the wood he was on was quite unstable. And there's a lot of current moving through that wood. I took the rope off of his waist and hung on to him while Sam lowered a PFD down my tether line so that I could put him into his own line and his own PFD. As Chris removes the blanket, the extent of Scott's injuries become evident. He was very, very hurt. He traveled a great distance through many obstacles, about 200 meters of steep creek, two log jams, very steep cascading rocks. All his limbs, his arms, his knees, his elbows, everything was black and blue. He'd been in the water for a little over an hour. He was very, very cold and not very coherent. In addition to hypothermia and fatigue, Scott is also suffering from a broken right arm, nerve damage to his face, and massive contusions to his legs, as well as various cuts and bruises all over his body. He needs to be evacuated immediately, and with only one other SAR member on site, Chris must enlist the help of the people already there. This, of course, is not the usual procedure. When you arrive on scene, there's a bunch of people who don't know what they're doing, trying to do the best they can. So when you come in, you must take charge, make it safe, get it done right. Well, we're given a set of rules on a, a rescue scene. There's a priority, you could say. I come first, then my team members, then bystanders, the subject, and right at the bottom is equipment. Bystanders are above subjects in priority because, despite good intentions, they can often hinder the rescue operation by putting themselves or others in danger. Wisely, no one here had attempted to rescue Scott, 
but with Chris and Sam now on site, it will be a team effort to do so. Once he was in a safe position, had a PFD on, then the real work. How do I get him to shore? It's not easy ground, and he can't move himself. I sat there for a few minutes, looked at my options, and realized the only way I'm going to get him to shore is if I physically carry him to shore. I didn't see any other way. We didn't have the manpower. We weren't going to build bridges or put boards down. It would have taken too long, and he didn't have the time. When I saw Chris coming, I, I thought, well, you know, this guy's it's like the Incredible Hulk coming. He's, he's massive. So he comes out and he says, Scott, do you know how you're going to get out of here? He says, you're going to get on my back. And I did warn him about my, my weight, you know, but uh, he, he, he just laughed. <laughs> I only had to move him about five feet from one log to another, but lots of debris in my feet, lots of current. He's not a small individual. I basically said to him, this is going to hurt a lot, but it's going to save your life. You Got to move. Chris gets into position, acutely aware of the death trap just downstream. You can walk in creeks like this up to your knees, but the moment you trip or fall, you're no longer in control and you're going where the river takes you. We did it in stages, so and he was very good. He said, what I'm going to do, you're going to get on my back and I'm going to drop your butt right there. I took his good arm, kind of wrenched it over my shoulder like a fireman's carry and just lifted him up. It was really good for me, and I'm sure this is the, the search and rescue procedure, to explain to the person what they're doing. And I can hear them talking to each other. We're going to do this. I'm going to hook this here. Do you need help over there? And I'm thinking, these guys, these guys totally know what they're doing. It was a really, really good feeling. I figured if I, I laid him on his back, because it was such a steep bank, he's on tether. I'll just get everyone up on the shore to pull it as I push him up and we'll just drag him right to a flat, safe spot where we can start working on him. I didn't really feel a lot of pain until the next day. I was pretty frozen, I was pretty cold. Paramedics tend to Scott's injuries while the bystanders clear a path for the stretcher. He was very cold, very hypothermic, and there wasn't much of his body that I didn't see marks, bruises. The sheer fact that he made it that 200 meters down that creek to that location is a miracle in itself. Surprisingly, this miracle of survival was not the result of an accident. Scott had in fact deliberately jumped into the creek. Why? He was attempting to rescue his friend's dog, Buttercup. Well, I was being tended to by search and rescue. Of course, I was asking how Buttercup was. How's the dog? Where's the dog? Just two hours earlier, Scott, his friend Joyce, and her niece Cheryl were crossing a footbridge on their morning hike when Buttercup, Joyce's Pomeranian poodle cross, fell into the swift moving water. I thought, uh, well, I gotta go in and get her because she's not gonna survive. And I, I know how important Buttercup is to Joyce. She's, and how important Buttercup is to me and how important Joyce is to me. So if I act now, I can leap, I can grab her and whoosh, fling her to shore, and then I'm sure I will be fine. Acting on pure instinct, Scott jumps in. For a brief moment, he believes that everything is under control. I felt like I wasn't moving. It was almost time was frozen. Buttercup was uh, a few feet ahead of me, maybe four, and she turned and looked at me, and she was dog paddling, and I, I went to reach out, and as I reached out, the slingshot hit me. The current rocket Scott downstream. It's like being in a washing machine. There was, uh, there was spinning around, uh, there was going upside down, there was you know running into things. I hit pretty hard three times into something with the head. <laughs> I did think, so Scott, this is how you go drowning. I never would have guessed. But just seconds before slamming into a deadly pile of fallen logs, something snags his jacket. 
and suddenly I stopped. If I'd gone another two, maybe three seconds, I probably would have been toast. I remember sitting in the water for an extended period of time until I could start to take bigger breaths and I felt that I was ready to make a move and I remember nothing until I was on the log. Alone and perched precariously on a log in freezing waters for approximately 45 minutes, Scott was eventually found by his hiking partner Cheryl, who then called 911. It wasn't for me hearing that search and rescue was coming, I literally might have tried to save myself. And I said, as long as I know search and rescue is coming, I can sit here forever. So, successful rescue. Uh, subject is quite warm. Had some pretty substantial injuries. Um, unbelievably lucky to be alive. I'm glad we were able to help him self-rescue that last bit. Scott is back at work, but things haven't been the same without Buttercup's daily visits. I made it, I'm glad to be alive, everybody was great. Things like that happen, you know, you can't dwell on it, I survived, I'm gonna be 100%. So for me, uh, I've lost, you know, a dog that was very important to me, my best friend lost her dog, and that still goes on. And that'll go on for a while. Okay, guys. Now, Nelson SAR member Chris Armstrong travels to Winnipeg, Manitoba to take part in the annual SAR scene games and conference. Members from all across Canada get together and compete in all different ground search and rescue skills. Friday, 3.30 p.m. Volunteer ground and aerial search and rescue teams are deployed along the coastline looking for a downed plane and its missing passengers. They are soon joined by Canadian Forces SAR technicians, Parks Canada, the Canadian Coast Guard and the RCMP. Despite their varied training and areas of expertise, it's not uncommon to find all these different agencies coordinating their efforts and working cohesively on a search and rescue mission. For this network of SAR resources to remain effective as a whole, it's crucial that each group become familiar with the other. One way to achieve this is at SAR scene, Canada's annual search and rescue conference. This is a heating device, so if you're not familiar with it, it's a Over three bird. days, this event connects both paid and unpaid SAR professionals in forums and exercises designed to exchange skills, technology, and knowledge. We talk about the challenges that we all face, so we talk about the issues, and also look at how can all of these partners work together uh, from those that uh, do search and rescue as a career choice versus the 19,000 specially trained search and rescue volunteers across Canada. So what can I do to fix that? Volunteers like Chris Armstrong of Nelson Search and Rescue, who has traveled from southeastern British Columbia to Winnipeg, Manitoba, to give us an inside look at this year's SAR scene. Right now we're at one of the regional parks being involved in the SAR games, where members from all across Canada get together and compete in all different ground search and rescue skills. Everything from first aid, slope embankment, navigation, pretty much all the core skills they need to be in search and rescue. Ten teams will rotate through various testing stations in hopes of winning the coveted title of national champion at these SAR games. Remember guys, you're not on a search. At the end of the day, there's going to be a winner, and that group will be able to go home with bragging rights for the, the next year. Ready, guys? We're running all ten of the competition teams through navigation, and so we give them a series of uh, distances and bearings, and they have to move from point to point. SAR members go out into the wilderness on most missions. They have to be able to find their way in and out often in very poor weather conditions. Navigation is a basic but very critical skill. It's pretty busy and all these events are pretty far apart, but we're just gonna head over to the survival section here and see how these guys are making out. The scenario is that the uh, victim has gone down and the weather has gotten bad and we're not able to get a helicopter in until the next day. Here, the SAR team must start a fire with a single match boil two liters of water for cooking, and build an overnight shelter for themselves and an injured subject. 
It may look easy, but imagine doing it in gale force winds and 10 foot snow drifts. These scenarios are based on actual call outs where the search teams are forced to hunker down in very challenging conditions. Across the park at another station, a cyclist has tumbled down a hill and fractured some bones. I'm with the Irish Coast Guard. What are you doing here today? Um, I've come over for the Sarsene Games. Uh, so one of the judges at the Games were judging the low angle cliff rescue. Yeah, you can talk me through it. What would you do? Teams are coming in for the, uh, the challenge. Uh, they've got to attach a, a rope onto the uh, stretcher put their casualty in, who's a, a mountain biker who's rolled to the bottom of an embankment, and they're trying to get the uh, casualty back up here to the top. 17 minutes remaining. Robin's a judge, but he's doing a great job doubling as the injured subject. It's taking ages. I'm such pain. We're working on it, sir. We're working on it. To add a sense of pressure, the players must complete the challenge within 20 minutes and without losing their cool. Oh, this bumping's hurting my knee. In the real world of search and rescue, low angle and high angle rope skills are a huge part of the job. Generally speaking, neither subject nor the rescuers get to choose where the incident occurs. We don't want to have too many knots going on, okay? So simple is better. I find it amazing. Uh, we've never met before. We're on different teams on different continents and we're bringing stuff the exact same way. Uh, handing the right piece of gear to each other at the right time. And it's amazing to see that comes from these events where people are coming together and sharing skills. Canadian Forces SAR technicians make a dramatic entrance into this year's SAR scene. Today, they are not only here to put on a show, but also to promote mutual aid between different SAR groups. How's that? Ready to jump on our plane? we just like to tell other agencies don't be afraid to, uh, to call us, get a hold of uh, Rescue Coordination Center. We can come and help, and the other way around too, anybody here can be used with us during our mission. My name is Mel, I'm with Canada and Canaan and First Aid, can I help you? Yeah. What's your name? My name is Laura. Laura, how are you doing? I'm really cold and wet, and I hurt my ankle, my leg, it really, really hurts. Your ankle, your leg. The scenario here, it's kind of an environmental hypothermic scenario with a few extra add-ons to that. So we're looking for scene management and proper care and packaging of the patients. Okay, I'm just about to start a, a primary rapid trauma survey here. Okay. Everyone has a different way of doing business, different gear, different approach, different environments to work in. So this SAR scene allows us to sort of meet face to face, get to know each other, and uh, it develops an understanding between the agencies of abilities, capabilities, and some ways to do business better. Overall, Parks Canada has highly skilled search and rescue teams across the country. They perform hundreds of missions each year. Their team does well in this challenge and in the competition overall, earning themselves a second place in this year's Sarcene Games. And first place? We have one from Sar Manitoba, the Northeast team. For these individuals who selflessly volunteer their time and energy year-round and expect nothing in return, a little recognition is a nice bonus. I'd like everybody to know we're very proud uh, of these games and very proud to take this trophy and, and look after it for a year. And uh, I guess we're going to have to come back next year and defend it and somewhere. I do say they have bragging rights for a full year and they take full advantage of it. And it's often difficult to get it back from them to retrieve it in preparation for the next Sarcene Games. So let us all together congratulate our 2011 award for leadership recipient. Congratulations. These aren't the only prizes given out at Sarcene. A special gala following the Games honors those who have made an exceptional contribution to search and rescue in Canada. Here at Sarcene, there's always a trade show attached where delegates can see all the new equipment, technology, software, all kinds of new toys. Let's go have a look. Our primary product is the RDC, the Rapid Deployment Craft. And it's an inflatable craft that is designed to be deployed in about one minute out of its bag so it's ready to put on the water within a minute or two after you arrive on scene. This is the air beam shelter. The air beam shelter is a blow-up type system. Plug it in and it just sets itself up. 
we have a vehicle that can get them out in the remote areas of the Arctic and Canada's north. It can adapt to any situation you find yourself in, uneven terrain. All the way if we can. A totally amphibious vehicle, all-terrain vehicle, has a carrying capacity of up to six people. It's a great tool for remote access areas. What we laid out here today is a bunch of products, none of which we are selling, but of all of which we actually promote. This entire package here will fit in a small pack and only weighs a few pounds. This is going to aid the uh, volunteers or the professionals to find you. So I hope you've enjoyed SAR scene, our national search and rescue convention. I'm heading back to Nelson, back to search and rescue. Call out search and rescue features, real stories, filmed live by search and rescue teams during actual missions. Find out more at calloutsar.tv.